Welcome everybody in this week's seminar. It's my pleasure to introduce Marek Luza from Free University Berlin. Marek, uh, I'm not sure, have you defended your PhD? You defended already your PhD, yes. I guess. Yes. Yeah, so, so Marek was a PhD student of Jens Eisert, uh, so he's a uh, first doctor. He specializes in many body physics, mathematical physics, well, various aspects of quantum information also, like including certification and I guess about the latter topic, certification of quantum states, he'll be telling us today. So it's great to have you, Mike. Thanks for joining us from your holidays. The screen is yours. Yeah. Okay. Thank, thanks, Michal. Uh, great to see you guys. Um, uh, but before maybe we start, uh, do you usually interrupt? Because that, that would be also fine that, that, that you ask questions on the way or uh, what's your uh, questions? We tend to interrupt. Okay. So, um, yeah. If, if that's all, all right with the format, then feel free to, to just ask any questions. Okay, so um, I guess the sound is all right, so let, let's get started. And I want to start by saying that it's really hard to guess what the future will bring for quantum technologies. And largely, this is quite a hard task because that's what our research is all about. But uh, it's also a question about economy. And in this situation, it's good to consult a magic ball. And I was really happy to, um, to find the, this uh, wonderful device in the Science Museum in Amsterdam. So now I will tell you what, uh, what the magic ball tells us about quantum technology. And basically the first thing we will hear is that um, the future will bring many qubits. And this is basically what we, uh, what we see in, in papers uh, coming to archive every day. The devices are getting larger. And um, the second statement the paper are telling us is that those qubits are getting better. So um, good qubits uh, would be defined that basically what people were saying since the 19th, we need to be able to somehow protect the quantum effects on, on our uh, synthetic systems. And this is largely what people managed to do over the, the last uh, few decades. And those decades brought always better technologies and, and that, that's sort of this happy phase uh, of development that, that we are seeing right now. So we have uh, quite good qubits and there's quite many of them these days. So now what's the next step? And what our magic ball tells us is that once those qubits become um, very plenty and they will be super good, it's, it's our job to use them for something useful. So we need to reach into the devices and um, and get some in interesting information out of um, out of our device. Uh, so now imagine that that the technology is developed as, as they should. Uh, all the milestones are being reached, and now um, now you have this powerful device. And imagine you're this experimentalist that is, that is putting those qubits together, and suddenly you say, "Okay, but my device is so huge, I don't know how to work with this because it's it's really." starting to perform as it should. So it's starting to outperform classical computers. And the first question an experimentalist will say, I have this large device and how can I know? Um, where no means how can I verify this device to say it's performing correctly. I have many good qubits and they, they are telling me something useful, which I want to use. But how do I know that, that the, the device is not just telling me 42 and that's the answer to everything? How can I know that this is really the sophisticated answer to something that I didn't know before? And, um, and it's a tough question. It, it, it's also a nice question conceptually. You can try it out with people from general public. You tell them there's this, this quantum mechanics and, and you're already good on the way. And then you start telling them, but there's this question and, and people really understand it quite intuitively. You have this powerful device. It's more powerful than your smartphone or our biggest smartphones of the size of a factory. And it's, it's, it's telling us something. And how do we know we can trust this device? And there's a lot of people trying to answer uh, and, and give some ideas how we can trust uh, those devices. So here's a nice infographic uh, from a review written by my colleagues in Berlin uh, together with the group of Elham Kashafi. And basically what they draw here is this, this whole um, landscape of, of what we have so far to, to benchmark and, and try to verify the performance of a quantum device or a protocol. So um, the upper cloud, so to speak, are the tomographic methods. You can think of them as, as sort of the brute force uh, methods that experimentalists like in the beginning. 
then once you once your system grows there's uh, there's this really nice variant of um, of tomography which is tensor network tomography which can perform for a larger system size than, than standard tomography um, so the the upper cloud is sort of limited by size it's it's a little bit more than, than a dozen of qubits that you can uh, treat that way and then um, then there's also other methods so um, on the left hand side we have blind verified computing, which is a marvelous method. And here it's it's um, it's um, positioned as having the weakest assumptions, which is actually true. But for an experimentalist, it's actually one of the protocols that, that has the strongest assumptions because it's assuming a fault tolerant uh, MBQC computer that is performing well. And, and it's basically the problem here is that there's a large threshold for the method to behave well. Um, so, so th those are some methods that, that conceptually resolve important problems. Uh, e uh, and basically, we know now that you can run interactive proof systems and, and things like this with quantum uh, protocols, but it's not so practical in, in, uh, in that sense. Um, Michal, I see you unmuted. Is there anything? Yeah, yeah I, I was wondering, I actually don't know this tensor network tomography. So, is it uh, like you assume that your is it a, a form of state tomography? Or yes. like you assume it's uh, mm -hmm. has tensor network structure. Like, yes, yes. Um, so this is actually what I'm working on actively these days. And the idea is basically that you want to do tomography based um, over a variational set. So uh, mm -hmm. uh, so if you have some measurements, you would like to reconstruct um, uh, the, the, the best fit to the density matrix given the, the constraints. But now, if you do it on the uh, over the the SDP cone, then then the dimension grows quite fast. And now you can do it over the parameters of some sort of tensor network. And I will be actually talking about this one a little bit on the way because that's one of the methods um, that connects to, to to the topic today. So you can do it over a tensor network. And um, what I was working on during my PhD is to do tomography for phonons. So here you can think of a BEC with, with some sort of um, phononic field theory, and and then you can still do tomography if you if you consider a good variational set, which is just Gaussian state uh, states mm -hmm. in this case, for example. And you can do it in optical lattice for, uh, lattices for three fermions, um, so you can really get coherences and and lower bound entanglement costs from that and so on. Um, so. It's basically you, you, you try to fit your observations given um, the best fit within a family. And sure, tensor network sure. Them, yeah. So yeah. Just, just, no, I, I, I totally get it. And I don't want to like interrupt, like what you'll be describing, I guess, this fermionic setting, the other settings in detail later. But regarding tensor network, like uh, if you have a fixed, let's say, network, uh, like, uh, you you have variational space like here, but like do you also kind of optimize over the structure of the mm. network there? Yeah, so um, the papers I know um, that so you you should look up basically. Um, I will put the archive link on on one slide. Um, I think in on some of the slides it will appear. So that was basically um, uh, Marcus Kramer and David Polian and 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 David Gross and and so on. So they proposed this method, and then there was also application to to a one-dimensional chain of, tra of trapped ions. So once once your the dimensionality of the system sort of fits your tensor network, then then you just take an MPS, for example. That would be uh, uh, okay, I understand, but like in principle, you can how to put it like uh, I guess in experiments you can maybe expect that your state will be coming from. MPL from tensor network of particle structure, like yeah. for for example, if you you are you expect to be close to uh, like ground state on a on a line with like a gapped system, then like it's uh, uh, in, it's it's MPS. But in in, in general, uh, uh, in general, like you you know, uh, you don't like know. do you compare different? Okay, so it's like. Uh, like there is some guess which network that would be, let's say. Yes, and and the method okay. will appear because um, uh, because that that was one of the the pioneering ideas, like at least how it developed uh, in my understanding. So I learned uh, some tricks from those papers, 
and basically mm -hmm. they resolved your issue. So you, you kind of find the best tensor network that fits the data, but how close it is it to act the actual state? And they proposed already a method to verify this uh, via parent Hamiltonian. Mm -hmm. So mm -hmm. I will give this as, as an example of of, cool. um, of of this verification method that I'm talking about. Yeah. Today. Uh, please go ahead. I, I'm not gonna like okay, interrupt cool. further because it sounds exciting. Yeah. Yeah. So so tensor network tomography will appear again. A couple of the methods I, I don't have time to mention. And in the middle, there's this land of heuristics, where you sort of um, try your best in, in a high dimensional space for particularly stacked states. Uh, so I will, I hope I will get to direct fidelity estimation a little bit to give you some idea. And um, I will be talking about fidelity witnessing. Um, that's basically what I want to tell you today. Um, so ju just very briefly, the motivation from the experimental side why, why you want to be dealing with those problems is, for example, that you might want to implement a protocol where you engineer some sort of synthetic evolution and what would be coming from the circuit model would be some trotterized evolution where um, the trotterization gives you the individual gates. This is nice because um, then physicists can approximate some nice physics models and then every physicist is happy. Experimentalists are happy with such a um, simulation model because it, they just need to put simple um, pulses together and then crunch how well they can do it. And then, of course, it's programmable and, and then uh, eventually universal. So, so that's a nice model. Um, usually, what you find is that uh, when experimentalists are coming up with a new platform, they usually try this kind of stuff. So here are three examples on three different platforms, strapped ions, circuit QD, superconducting cube, uh, circuits. And all of them were using, for example, a benchmark to try to start with a product state. So it's e an easy starting point. And then you have um, you want to somehow start entangling the qubits, but also have some some quantum uh, dynamics going on, and it's also related to to some Rabi flopping and, and and inducing some oscillations, which they can nicely test, and 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 um, it's nice physics for for just checking the performance of the device early on. But um, this kind of model is really the go-to model for everybody because it it just says like you have the entangling or coupling gate for example an x, x gate and something which is which is not commuting with this gate a, a single qubit gate so usually if you if you propose a new qubit first you start with single qubit gates you show that you have a qubit and then you show that you can you can have many qubits and then you want to show that they are good and this is wh where my talk is coming in because everybody is for example playing with this model experimentally it's really a fun thing to do just so, uh... yeah Maybe I, I got like, so you were just talking about the uh, transverse field Ising, right? Uh, just now. So, but it's uh, maybe on the, just one can add that on the downside, this is like, uh, for the, cause it's exactly solvable, right? Whatever is happening. So this is maybe that's why people like to kind of test uh, cause they can compare with uh, what they get on a classical device, mm -hmm. <laughs> right? Um, it's true and not. So uh, actually, everybody will think that we coordinated because that's really a great question for me to start talking about this, because it's it's usually the, this kind of um, kind of statement that people give. It's kind of a criticism, but not. But you should appreciate that in 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 hardware, it's not easy to do those things, and it's actually difficult to to do exactly this model sometimes. You know, so that that's also one thing to appreciate that. Often in experiments, it's easy to break into gravity, or um, you know, you might have uh, some sort of noise running over your system, and it will start driving you away from the pre-fermion uh, description. So, and um, and also, what you can start doing is that if you can do those gates, you can also um, sprinkle in some other gates, and suddenly you go away from this. So they they start from this point because it it one this one has nice physics. Um, but it's not really because it's uh, solvable in, in, in the first place, because when you start with a handful of qubits, you have um, you have the cloud of tomographies that you can do. So you could also do something really funky. You could, you know, in principle. But this one is nice because it's, um, it's combining the XX gate with the Z that you have to alternate, and then it's a simple protocol. So, so I think this is quite natural why people 
studying this. Maybe there's some other issues, but I'm just trying to, to sure, sure. Say, say how, how it looks. Yeah, like. I'm just saying like, uh, I mean, like if one is cautious of all those tomographic or characterization techniques, then of course, like one flags, it, but also like some people are not, and then they just kind of compare the behavior and it's nice to know <laughs> what one should expect, right? Yes, so, yes, yes. And this is definitely something that experimentalists will say that they understand what should come out and um, and the phenomenology of the model out of equilibrium in equilibrium is really known. So th this is this is a nice thing that that, that it it is so in nature. I mean, Michal is working on on probably extending those exactly solvable models, and it's really hard. So we just got lucky that we have such a nice uh, one-dimensional model that that happens to be solvable in this way. Um, yeah. And it will feature again. Uh, I'm not saying that it's um, uh, that we should um, forget that that it's solvable. I mean, this is something that I will be using a lot, and um, uh, we will see that in, in in two slides, I think. Okay, so yeah, I'm not criticizing. I was not criticizing. Like no, no, no. But this is, this is an important discussion to have. But uh, what I'm always saying is that that in experiments, it's actually a state in Hilbert space. Uh, and there, there are many things can happen there. You know, you're basically in a highly dimensional space, and it's not so easy to be precisely on something that that happens to be a subgroup, which analytically is easy. So, by the way, if we are on this question, like, um, so I actually like in those, let's say, because you mentioned that they realize it in ion traps sometimes. Like, what, what about like other, uh, like, do they? That's like, like, do they uh, are they able to implement just general magic gates there? Yeah, I mean, yeah, it's it's usually okay. difficult. Um, it's it's sometimes difficult um, because you might some gates might be more natural than others. So. Um, mm -hmm. Yeah. Okay. You might know. Okay. Let's maybe postpone this discussion because it would be okay. actually be very interesting for me for other reasons. Okay. Please. Yeah. I, I'm okay. Not, I'm, sure. I stop uh, interrupt. Okay, so um, just a quick recap. We want many qubits. That, that's something that we all, all know that we need because otherwise um, out, otherwise your smartphone can simulate the device. And then you need precision because otherwise it's all noise. So it will be classical. Um, but then conceptually we have this, this question that, that appears like uh, whether we can certify the state preparation. And in the background, you still have the transverse Ising model. And for example, one thing to think about it is when quantum technologies reach fault, to fault tolerance and you have 100 logical qubits, you will be testing this model again. Because then you will want to show that you have a lot of coherence over the entire system and so on, and that, that you can you can get coherence of those um, composite logical qubits. Uh, and it, th this model, I think, will be reappearing a lot. OK, so how do we assess um, quality of a state preparation? This is um, our uh, fidelity function. In general, for two general matrices, it's, it's very complicated. And that's sort of my point, that uh, evaluating the fidelity is complicated. It's a function of those two density matrices. Those density matrices are highly dimensional um, as soon as your qubits are many and very good. And, um, and it's, um, it's a paradox, because your system is scaling up. You know that it's performing well, and you have no way to, to show a figure of merit if you cannot evaluate this function experimentally. Um, so this is where, where, um, where I'm going to tell you something um, possibly new, or, or at least where we try to have some sort of uh, contribution to, to have something to say here. And the first thing you want to do is to say that you start from maybe a product state and you run your uh, gates, which means your target state, the one that you want your experiment to prepare, it will be pure. And then the fidelity becomes simpler. It's either the, the sandwich with, with the uh, wave function or it's just um, uh, basically a Hilbert Schmidt scalar product. And this is something we use. To say that um, instead of measuring the fidelity, we want to relax the problem and measure something experimentally friendly. And the notion of exper experimentally friendly is uh, captured by this definition. So we want to measure an observable, or we want to find such an observable, and we will call it a fidelity witness uh, for some particular pure state um, row target. 
if there are two properties. So the first one is faithfulness. So basically to say that the witness will detect at least one state of high fidelity and that will be the target state. So if your experiment prepares precisely with equality the target state, your witness should have expectation value in the experiment equals one. And that will be the value of the fidelity because there's the robustness property, uh, property number two, where the expectation value in the experiment of your observable, this experimental differently observable, the fidelity witness W, this expectation value should be lower than the fidelity under the assumption that the target state, which is the theoretical state, that this one is, um, is pure. Okay. And you can compare those two um, definitions and you kind of see that it's expectation values on both sides. Once I have the expectation value, which I can compute and specify theoretically, it's the row T. It's not something that I need in the lab. And then you have the fidelity witness. So you just simplify the, the expectation value and you relax the problem. So um, the way it should work is that we know that fidelity is upper bounded by one, where the states are perfectly the same. And when it's zero, it's basically um, that there was a problem in the experiment. And now where the fidelity witness comes in is with this crucial property that you lower bound the fidelity. And what you want is that, um, that the fidelity witness has a large value. So if, if you have um, expectation value 99%, it means that your actually, actual fidelity is somewhere between super good and, and ideal. So you don't care what the fidelity is. You already know that, that the quality of the state preparation is extremely good. And, and this is sort of, why we have this definition because we wanted to conceptually say we want to assess fidelity because it's it's the figure of merit for quality but we don't care about the value of fidelity we, we care about the quality of the state preparation so it's good to, to maybe relax this to, to consider this fidelity witness and um, and this is how it works in in, in, in in practical applications then okay so uh, it would be a great moment for any questions because um, I don't know if this was clear enough, but that's sort of the spirit of the idea of this conceptual idea for the fidelity witness. Um, if there's um, if there's no questions, I mean you can come back with questions later. We can uh, hop on to to say why why this works, and um, this is just a geometrical picture. Here I want to define um, um, certification prop protocols for, for high quality state preparations. And basically the idea is that you want some criterion which tells you states that have a large value of that criterion, that observable, I accept and say here, I certify that my state preparation is good. And then some of the properties, uh, some of the state preparations you want to reject that they are bad. And, and the way fidelity witnesses behave is that sometimes small imperfections such that the fidelity is actually quite large those small imperfections might uh, get amplified by the witness and it might be too sensitive to something negligible so here it's it's sort of like the, this remark for caution you you have a tough function and it's hard to evaluate it because it's a question of two density matrices so it scales exponentially in the number of parameters so it's a tough problem you relax it now and, and that's the price to pay that Sometimes you will miss good preparations and you did everything correctly and maybe this method will not tell you that. And um, in, in the paper, in the appendix, we are giving some examples, um, for example, for, for very weak um, symmetry breaking and so on. Um, so um, this is how it looks. And basically that's the idea for state preparations. And, um, and uh, yeah, so, so this is mostly how certification tests will work. It's a question of yes or no, and decide based on experimental data whether you're dealing with a high fidelity state preparation. So to give you one example of state preparations is actually the, the most paradigmatic way of, of, of constructing su such um, certification tests is to consider um, Hamiltonians which have a spectral gap so um, and a unique ground state. So you look at the eigenvalues of the Hamiltonian, you go to the lowest eigenvalue and, and you want it to be separated from all the other ones. And this, um, this lowest uh, eigenvector should be unique. And a lot of Hamiltonians have this property. In particular, if you're dealing with tensor networks, there's, there's this whole understanding of, of parent Hamiltonians of tensor networks. And you can show 
or at least you have ways of arguing that they are gap and, and then they uniquely select that MPS. And this is what the MPS tomography has used. And actually you, you see that the paper, wait, I'm not sure if the link is not wrong. Um, I was sure that it was like 2014, but um, anyway, that was an early paper where they did the tomography over this restricted state that we know that will fail if you have a lot of entanglement going through your system. And then they said, okay, we will reconstruct it. And then we will measure the parent Hamiltonian. If the uh, energy of the parent Hamiltonian is lower than the gap, then all good, because that's how we certify it. Yeah. And they, they didn't really uh, stress this so much because um, it wasn't such a big topic. Uh, I mean, just five years ago, the devices weren't maybe so uh, so popular and, and, and you know, like, that these days you have a lot of devices that have 20 qubits and they need post tomographic um, ways of assessing the fidelity. So, but, uh, but um, sorry if the link is wrong, but, um, uh, but this is an early paper where you find this idea used in practice and, um, and it has all the features of, of, of this. So we came a little bit later and, and, and we just you, you know, were working on, on follow ups to those ideas and, and the fidelity witness is just a conceptual thing. The crux of everything is lies in finding the, the good observables. I mean, uh, everything else um, is much easier. So then there's the paper um, where Dominic Hangleiter wa was the lead um, pro uh, from um, from Berlin, and um, they, they showed basically that we can also do certification of even Sharpie hat tasks using those parent Hamiltonians. So what do you mean uh, exactly by Sharpie hat task? Um, I, I don't know, like, I think in, in that construction, they were using some funky cluster states and showing that, that um, um, then, then you go through, uh, you go usually through, through the chain that you take a cluster state, it's universal for MPQC, and then maybe you have um, uh, some Sharpie hat instance, um, uh, which, which has an easy state preparation. So this is how you put in the... You, the... you mean the, that some probability amplitude is Sharpie hat compute? Yeah, yeah, yeah. So, so, okay, okay. okay. So, so the task is you want to prepare a state, and then the samples are maybe, um, uh, may, maybe it's hard to sample from that one, and then you want to construct um, explicitly. Um, I don't know, maybe a, a cluster state or a tensor network which implements something like this, such that if you could do something with that, you would get um, an oracle to to to, to that complexity class. And um, and here you can use uh, this for frustration-free Hamiltonians and and ground state of ground states of frustration-free Hamiltonians can be can be funny. So I think here it was mostly about cluster states and 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 this is then related to the proposal where Kwani was I think the first author um, with, with the Z, random ZZ gates and and so on, uh, where they also stressed this that that via the the ground state energy you you can check whether you actually prepared that distribution. Right, so if I, I guess, if I understand, like, so, so there's, like, some parts about what you're saying, I, I got a bit confused, but, but ultimately when you connect it to this, to this proposal uh, of quantum advantage by Juan, uh, Dominic, and uh, Jens and others, uh, uh, so uh, I guess there the point was that like on one end, like if you do something simple to that state, you measure in some way, you get something which well, one can argue it's very hard, uh, you know, for classical computers to mimic. But if you do some other stuff with it, like using similar setup, you can do certification. I think that's yeah. uh, uh, of the of the preparation of that state. So that increases your, let's say, trust in uh, that your device actually writing has issue. Yeah, yeah. So so that state preparation had the, the feature which is different from random circuit something that um, that you can re re interpret this as, as in some way a physical state a little bit. And and then you you can say that you 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 can basically correl the state against the boundary and say that basically the only state that can have this feature mm -hmm. because it's somehow like this extremal eigenvalue for, for this local object. 
on the internet. Yeah, good. So those are some nice examples, and and those are the, the really important ones that that we know in practice. And and often, if you make some um, some sophisticated protocol, you can think of of adding this kind of simple idea, and 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 um, and at least you will not run into an endless discussion about cross entropies. So uh, <laughs> that that's um, uh, that that's sometimes nice to have. Okay, so this slide will be a little bit dense, but just to give you an idea of why the, all this stuff works is, for example, if we think of magnetization, so you have, uh, you sum up all the Pauli Zs, and then what you see is that the, and this gives you the extremal eigenvalue for, for only one state, which is all ups. And any state which has some admixture of, of some spin flip will lower this expectation value, and that's basically the idea of those Hamiltonians. So there's one way of thinking about fidelity witnesses that they that the loss of fidelity is a little a little bit like a notion of excitation energy or something like this so that that's maybe some way of, of interpreting this and um, i'm not sure if i will be able to convey all this um, intuition but this is sometimes also the biggest weakness of of the approach because um, because sometimes you you just start uh, becoming oversensitive to, to, to some um, some deviations in the experiment. But that's basically the idea that you want to look for, uh, for something like this. Um, what we have in the appendix of the paper is basically saying that, that you have a general way of constructing it, where uh, there's a long definition, but basically your target state should be a part of, of, um, of a summation of, of projectors, because the target state is a projector. And then you add some other projectors that, that you uh, basically become complete and sum up to the identity. And then what you want to do is construct a witness um, where, um, where you can optimize the spectrum of, of that operator here with the lambdas uh, being whatever you choose. But they should start um, from something separated from zero and this delta then helps you to detect um, the fidelity in, in a more robust way. So this is um, just very formal. This is um, this is just writing down a a construction. But um, then it's all about trying to to say that this witness W is of the form um, call the M like the, this local operator because um, actual projectors are maybe a little bit hard to measure and you want to express it as some sort of local Hamiltonian. Um, the way you prove this kind of stuff is showing that that, um, that you have some sort of uh, SDP monotonicity between the observables, and this is how you get the lower bound for the fidelity. So, so that that's sort of the idea of uh, what to look for if you want to prove uh, uh, that uh, that some some operator is actually a fidelity witness to some pure state. So that, that's one thing. Um, then, then you can also think of other constructions. So if you have a fidelity witness for, for some state, and then you say it's my reference state, so I say this is my zero basis, then you can say that any rotation of that witness will become a witness to a new state. Um, oops, uh, and that, there's a typo, sorry. Um, so, um, so basically what I'm saying is that the rotated previous witness is a witness for the state uh, psi equals u rotating your, your reference state. And now the problem is that you, if you look at u of some wu, it might become an observable that has exponentially Pauli's that you would need to measure, and that's a problem. So um, just um, last month, I, I um, learned about this um, uh, paper here, where they are talking actually about um, carton subalgebras, and that's mostly um, a note to Michal, because I think you will like the, this um, paper if you don't know it yet, because um, it's basically um, recapping what, uh, what I was wondering about. So fidelity witnesses work for Gaussian sy systems, and I think um, the efficient ones, which don't need exponentially many poly operators, are efficient either because um, the rotation U has um, a bounded depth, uh, so, so you actually don't rotate onto many polys, or you have some subalgebra and, and cut on subalgebras, I think, are maybe the most general way to, to try to characterize the efficient ones. Okay, but this is quite a quick remark, and I don't have much more to say there. What I wanted to still tell you. Sorry, can is... you just uh, can you keep it for just a second? I try to. Yeah. Uh, 
so you mean that those operators A are in the Lie algebra of uh, yeah. AK, they are in the Lie algebra. So basically this W0 is in the Lie algebra A. Yeah, it, it might be some um, some form over the Lie algebra. So, mm -hmm. so some ex expression in, in that algebra. But then, mm -hmm. then you want also some rotation U that such that it doesn't spread um, those, those generators too far. And, and mm -hmm. then cut and sub algebras are useful for this. And, um, and in that paper, what they were interested in was to say, I want to measure energy in, in some NIST device. So I want mm -hmm. to um, bunch the operators together such that they somehow are related to a Lie algebra or a, a cut and sub algebra. This is what they do in the paper. And then they say, actually, I can try to undo it in data. Uh, and I will have fewer observables that I need to measure. That, that's something uh, that interesting. Uh, thanks for. Yeah. So, so um, and I was thinking about this in the context of fidelity witnesses for a long time. So I, I think this is related to, to so basically measuring, measuring energy in a NISC device is like measuring a fidelity witness that, that is efficient. So, so that's, that's why those two are related. Okay. So um, I would like to switch gears and tell you about a particular specific witness that is interesting to Michal. Uh, and, um, and I will tell you only today about Gaussian uh, fermionic witnesses. And this is interesting for physicists because actually different systems can behave like Gaussian fermions. So fermions can behave like they are non-interacting and they will have Gaussian dynamics. But also bosons, that, that's also a nice thing in one dimensions that the Tonks gas um, basically becomes a um, Gaussian fermionic system. You have spins, which we already talked about the transverse Ising model, thanks to the Jordan Binger transformation. And then, of course, what Miha was mentioning, all the match fit stuff, the Kitaev Honeycomb model, which is in 2D, but it's also related to Jordan Binger transformations in a nice way. And then you can use Gaussian fermions also for, for combinatorial um, stuff uh, if you do the, uh, the mapping in the right way. Good. So, so this is why we want to, to be talking about this. And we want to talk about fidelity witnesses also mostly because of the experiments. But now I just want to sketch the notation that I will need um, for Gaussian fermions. And um, so the first bullet point is how we define the algebra of Canonical, uh, canonically anti-commuting fermions. So I have F at dagger and they are sort of anti-symmetric. And, um, and we can uh, take the formal real and imaginary part of those two operators and we obtain the Clifford algebra, so the Majorana operators. And now if we consider Majorana operators, um, the quadratic form of those gives us um, basically the generators of, um, of the subgroup in the whole Hilbert space, which is the, in the Gaussian unitary group. And it behaves very, very nicely. So if I make uh, the evolution in Hilbert space of my uh, M operator, which is the generator of the Clifford algebra, then it will become just a linear um, mixture or, or a linear uh, superposition of those other operators. And here the um, S, um, SO group be, uh, becomes nicely visible because the, the coefficients are actually orthogonal matrices and the generators for those orthogonal matrices are precisely the couplings. So it's a very nice formalism. And the point of this is that when we are working with, uh, with Gaussian fermions, so the equivalent of bosonic linear optics, so fermionic linear optics, our goal will be always to express all physical properties or quantities uh, using linearly large matrices because the coupling matrix of a, uh, of a Gaussian Hamiltonian is growing with the uh, number of physical sites that we have and not exponentially like the uh, Hilbert space. So below the, the matrices M, E to I, H, T are exponentially large, but we can get the dynamics of M using a polynomially large matrix. So that, that's um, the important bit. And in this spirit, I can give you our um, uh, formula for the fidelity witness of, uh, for Gaussian fermionic states. So Gaussian fermionic states are basically states which are prepared from a reference state, for example, uh, uh, vacuum. So the, the kernel of all the F operators. And then you run any sort of evolution generated by a quadratic Hamiltonian that depends on, on this uh, uh, matrix A. So you, uh, uh, any Gaussian state is of the form Psi and then E to I H T and, and then uh, a vacuum state essentially. So in the positive parity terms, yeah. 
So those kind of states can be our target matrices. This is denoted by rho t. And now I can ask how close in fidelity am I close to, to, to this Gaussian state if my state preparation is sort of unknown and it's the, the some states rho p. And the important bit is that in the experiment, you don't know whether it's Gaussian or non-Gaussian. It's with probability one non-Gaussian. So this formula doesn't depend on whether the, the state preparation in the experiment is Gaussian or not Gaussian. It, it, it's valid for any covariance matrix. And, and the bulk, the, the large formula is uh, depends on the second moment of the matrix. So for any density matrix, I can define the collection of the second moments. So we had our symbols MJ, MK, which are the Majorana operators. We formed the quadratic expression MJ, MK, and then take the expectation value in some sort of density matrix. For a Gaussian state, this collection, which is quadratically large, uh, specifies uniquely the state. For a non-Gaussian state, it's just a collection that tells you about the physics of the state. But what the formula is showing you is that you get the lower bound to the fidelity between those two states, the non possibly non-Gaussian state and the Gaussian target state, by considering essentially a Hilbert-Schmidt product in the mode space. So those matrices M, J, K are of the dimension 2L by 2L. And what you have is that if you measure that your unknown density matrix has the same second moment as a pure target state, then this will be zero. The whole bracket collapses to zero, you get one, and this means that you have fidelity one. Okay, so second moments are so unique and so special for Gaussian states that even a non-Gaussian state that, that has close second moments has to be close in fidelity. This is the meaning of this formula. And the important bit is that we, we use this, this box correctly because we collapse something that is exponentially large to something which is polynomially large in terms of observables. Um, so that's why it's nice. And now suddenly, instead of doing 15 qubits, I can do 150 qubits with that. Yeah? And, and that, that's all the difference. And suddenly that state might be quite complicated in the lab. It's, it's not so clear that, that an experiment knows about group representations and, and free fragments and, and, and all this stuff. Okay, so um, so the, this is nice a nice feature for the experimentalists. So um, I will tell you more about this fidelity witness, how it behaves uh, next, but I would just um, like to say that this was a really fun project with uh, Martin Tisch, Jens Eisett and Leandro Aolita. So, um, so we worked on this um, in the beginning of my PhD and it's uh, quite related to what they did for bosons, but then we zoomed out a little bit and and, um, and tried to, to get a little bit more understanding into those structures. That's why we have this notion of fidelity witnesses in our paper and so on. But you will find a lot of information for bosonic linear optics in the second paper that I'm uh, listing here. And then Leandro with his student um, had a really nice follow up also considering open systems. So it's, um, or at least um, some structured operations. So um, those are um, some papers on the Gaussian uh, Gaussian groups. For uh, uh, sorry, Mike, uh, this, um, actually I was not aware of this last part. So they, they have witnesses for uh, uh, like Gaussian channels, the Boson Gaussian channels. Yeah, but, um, but I, th I think, I'm not sure if, if it was all, it was like particular operations um, that, that are admissible for this. And for what was interesting for me, because like we, uh, I was reworking the, the, the older paper quite a lot. And then we were happy to find this formula and, and so on, um, which was quite appealing to find it this way. And the old paper was quite complicated. And what was more important for me uh, was that um, they found a way of simplifying that bosonic paper as well. So the the all, uh, youngest paper, the uh, 2018 paper is also adding contributions to the bosonic linear optics case, plus the, the, the more general operations. So not, not only thinking about state preparations, but maybe also gates. So, um, and, and of course it's not well written because that's, that's um, goes without saying so. I quite recommend that one. Good, um, just to give you an example, um, the way this fidelity witness can work in some sort of NISC scenario is that you prepare uh, the, the 
polarized state, so maybe the zero state or all up state. And then you say I'm, I'm in, uh, alternating my XX gates with the Z gates and I have the so-called quench in this transverse Ising model. This model is nice also for large systems because we know that uh, entanglement will grow uh, as fast as it can in, in such a system. So you will produce a lot of uh, interesting correlations and, and there will be a lot of things going on. What I was working on is also showing um, equilibration in, in, in this kind of quenches, but of course there's a lot of work that um, over more than a decade on this model and, and showing equilibration in this one. So, um, so if you're interested in non-equilibrium dynamics of the particular model, analytically, there's the paper by Maurizio Fagotti and Fabian Esler, for example. So we know that the non-equilibrium physics of this model quite well. And then what Michal was saying, if you know the physics, it's nice to, to also try to, uh, to, to see whether an experiment can be realize such large systems. And here I'm showing the application uh, of the fidelity witness to such state preparation. So you want to evolve your um, your state to for it to become entangled after this evolution. But you say I I don't make the smooth evolution. I I implement this by alternating the gates. So on the right hand side, uh, the the plot on the right uh, has on the x axis the number of trotter steps that you're using. And then the different colors is, is the, the, the uh, system size. And the idea is that you don't want to have too many trotter steps, but still approximate the state uh, well. And, and basically everything above is what the actual fidelity would be. Uh, but then, then in an experiment, you would basically maybe do 60 sides and 100 trotter steps, which will give you fidelity with uh, fidelity lower bound of around 85. That would be the idea, and, and this is really that simple. Um, so you get those lower bounds for, for example, trotterization. And um, I got a really happy surprise uh, uh, last year because this kind of idea to, to check that the trotterization is doing its job was um, uh, was implemented on on the new Sycamore chip uh, by Google and the Google AI collaboration. So what they did was not the quench evolution, but to try to prepare an initial state for some further um, BQE in, in, in the future. So, so try to get already a good starting point and then, then make uh, some rounds of optimization with the quantum device. And um, they also say it in the paper that they wanted to do this because they have this device and, and they wanted to use an efficient method such that it works uh, nicely and can tell them that this fairly large circuit has worked well. So what they do here is they want to prepare a, a, an initial basis state in panel A. Then they have the circuit shown as the big box and the gates that they are using are actually composed. So, so the, the, the circuit volume is actually a little bit larger than you see because you have the swap gates and a lot of um, local phase flips. And those phase flips are engineered in such a way that, um, that you, you can basically prepare uh, fermionic uh, Gaussian states um, I don't know, Michal, if you're working on given rotations, but it's actually a really nice formalism as well. Okay, so they, they knew exactly what they want to do. And then the question was whether there's some um, crosstalk in the system and it destroys your nice picture or not. And this is basically summarized in the table. It's a lot of numbers, but those are nice numbers because um, uh, what you have is um, as you go down, you have the, the, the length of the system. So from six uh, hydrogen atoms, I guess, to, to 12. And then as you go to the right, you have different stages of error mitigation. And after the last one, so all the numbers are fidelity witness values. And the last ones is what I was telling you. If the fidelity witness is 99, you basically your, your fidelity is, is good enough. And they show that, that after all those mitigation stages, this becomes essentially constant. I mean, it, it doesn't drop off so much. So I'm a bit, okay, I understand pretty well the uh, fidelity witnesses and very nice formulas, but okay, I know it's not your result, but like, I'm a bit confused about interpretation of the results when you use a uh, mitigation. Because you sort of, you know, you throw away, like, for, I know, I, okay, I. I'm very well aware of this paper. I don't know its details though. So, but what I what I remember from what Google was doing sometimes 
and it makes sense to do some stuff like this is like, like to throw away states that are not in the appropriate subspace right because yes. like here i think you have half feeling for example so yeah. so you don't want like you will be throwing away all the uh, out like output strings that won't uh, satisfy a feeling for example yeah. right uh, and then you know it's like doing some post selection effectively mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. right so uh, the question is like and, and then like if you put it together with, with your formalism then it's not telling something like those numbers that don't tell something actually about a state that was actually preferred but rather about the kind of post selected state maybe yeah, like yeah. so i think i would be fine with post selection in in some way so post selection is a little bit easier so the whole goal was here to have already a uh, a semi-optimized basis to have a good starting point for some um, uh, some rounds of optimization with the quantum device so you want to to not to start maybe already from some entangled uh, base and 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 then given rotations for example are quite efficient in giving you that so so that that's a good starting point and then the idea was i think so you cannot measure in between because you will collapse your state so that's bad so you, you cannot know which of your state preparations were a good starting point and which were ba a bad one but if you make a short depth optimization so you, you're still kind of adding just just a bunch of gates which are maybe many body to to lower the, the energy then you can still post select there and and maybe you get some idea of how much more of the interesting beyond hardly fog gates you can add such that your fidelity doesn't collapse so much and you do this post selection only at the end um, wait i'm a bit confused because like didn't they do just sort of hard free fog in this experiment yeah, yeah but i mean if they wanted to you just change a, a little bit the angles that, that generate the swaps or something like this or, or just sure. some other control and, and suddenly you have a many body gate uh true so but in the experiment it's easy to to start optimizing variationally over um, over a non-gaussian hartree fox state so what what I imagine could be one idea is that you prepare this Hartree Fox state and then then you have maybe ten variational param parameters to say I want to still lower the energy beyond what Hartree Fox can give me, and then you would have to do post selection at the end. But mm -hmm. I think the idea would be that this post selection at the end would give you a similar improvement here. I mean, for twelve qubits, you see that from one percent fidelity lower bound, you go to sixty five using post selection. So that this is yeah 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 but like this post selection it, it means like if you collect enough statistics right <laughs> for, for but this is or... something they have the right to do i mean at some point it will it will uh it will be just i mean you... no 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 they, they do have rights to do it will be just inefficient like here it's 12 it's, so it's it will fine. be inefficient but this is the strength of superconducting qubits that they have much higher repetition rates than than cold atoms so i'm, I'm fair actually, enough I'm actually interested in, in cold atoms a lot, and, and there you have to suffer for your statistics. Here you 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 have like really a lot of um, wealth of of data, so you can you can drop it a little bit. But I think um, as you go on and you have more qubits, it it will probably be exponential at some point, right? So the constants are favorable for superconducting qubits, but at some point it will be a problem. And um, I think for error mitigation, it's important to start understanding like the error sources and, and try to keep the system within the symmetry structure. And, um, and cold atoms can do it by, by, uh, by nature. But um, yeah. here, I think many people are working probably on it. I don't follow the literature so much. The purification step for me was a little bit more funky because it. Uh, Wait, uh, can you explain? Because I don't like I understand post. I know post selection. What what in this concept post selection means? But purification. Yeah. So I, I I didn't understand the. I don't. I didn't understand why exactly this is the right thing to do because it seemed a little bit like an extrapolation, and extrapolations are part of error mitigation because you can try to extrapolate towards the, the optimal state and then, then use the observables from that and that 
could give you the right answer maybe maybe that that's the idea but uh, but this purification is a modification of the data that um, that replaces the data by a different state i think so they explain basically how to optimize the the obtained covariance matrix to get the best pure gaussian state uh, <laughs> oh that's uh... If if I understood correctly, uh -huh. I mean I uh -huh. also did okay. but mm -hmm. uh, but they they have some description of optimizations happening there, and and that that can be one step. Uh, they cite a, a paper I think by Babush there, and and, and the, then maybe it's described in more length uh, in the paper. And this where this this VQE it. this VQE step, what is it like? like... Actually, I wanted to check, but didn't. But my ah, my, guess sure. is that, okay. my guess is that you have a little bit calibration issues, and then you can try to wobble your theta gates a little bit, and say that mm -hmm. that I don't know actually my quantization axis, but I can try to find it a little bit better, and then it gives you maybe a couple of percent fraction. Of the okay. But why not? And it it is sort of a a game against the 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 noise and feel free to use um, different techniques i think that uh, I, I would need to understand the purification um, idea a little bit more because um i think it works nicely without biasing you too much if you have 65 uh, percent fidelity uh, uh, after post-selection i think this is still okay but if you would go from one percent fidelity to purification it might be too far off it might be problematic yeah? okay so Good, yeah, that would be this one. And Michal, I think we are like one hour into the talk. I still have some stuff on generalizations and like a little bit of my story, how I failed to do anything interesting uh, <laughs> with, with uh, some other ideas. And so but, uh, uh, yeah. as, I, as I said, we are like, like there were many questions that we are like relaxed at this. Like, no, okay. You know, just go go ahead. Maybe if you can try to finish within fifteen minutes or so. Uh, okay. Um, yeah. So I could switch gears a little bit to tell you about some more ideas of of what might be interesting on the way. It, it will be more unrelated um, remarks. Uh, if there's any questions to this one, I am happy to also answer questions now. Good. But um, you can also go back to previous slides anytime if, if something wasn't clear. Okay, so one thing that, that we were talking about in the paper, and that's where I was learning new nice things like the Hawking inequality, was that if you want to make your certification test, you will be getting random data. From that random data, you will get an estimate from some for some figure of merit, but that figure of merit will be affected by, by the random statistics from your measurements. And then you can use, for example, the Hefting inequality to prove that with high probability, your estimator will be close to the true expectation value. And, um, and that, that's an important thing to keep in mind. And what we were doing in the paper was trying really hard to get the important sampling right, but we didn't find any setting that was non-trivial where we could get it to be a constant and not scale in the system size. Um, and the problem was that we were setting up important sampling, which is a powerful technique if you're already dealing with, with probabilities. It, it, often it can give you uh, uh, some sort of speed up in terms of uh, statistics or like an improvement in the scaling, but we weren't able to get a constant. But I think like the way we described it, it's, it's sort of like a generic method that you can use for many NISC problems of estimation and so on. It, it's, I think quite often worth to, to to consider this. So can you just comment a bit, like operationally, what what is important something refers to? Uh, so here, what I need to estimate is not really the entire covariance matrix, but we can replace this by an, a more complicated estimator, and say that if my target matrix doesn't have correlations, then whatever I measure will be suppressed by this anyway in the product. So I might not uh, need to take a lot of statistics for a particular correlation function because maybe it will be suppressed in the, in the overall cost function anyway. If you're talking about energies, you might have a scale of couplings. So you can use this kind of approach to, uh, to important something to maybe make fewer measurements for the, the bonds that are far away and have a lower coupling. 
it's set by the scale of, of the couplings in the Hamiltonian, for example. Okay. And Thanks. And yeah, so, so it will depend on target state, I understand. In right. this case, it will depend on your target state, but here you have this full information. So again, you should you should use it to, to know, know which kind of stuff you measure. And if I understand correctly, the, the, uh, the way it works for, for the experiments is that th those kind of fidelity witnesses, maybe with important something or without, are actually helping you because if you would do tomography instead, I mean, uh, the Google collaboration did uh, 12 qubits. This is still like the tomography regime. But if you want to do tomography and you still need to post-select, your, your correlators will be, will be noisy and so on. And you might not have enough data for, for like a um, really good estimate uh, tomographically. And here is where, where it kicks in that, that maybe having the, the statistical considerations is interesting. But um, yeah, that's just one remark. Um, here I wanted to go on to something else to, to tell you about some um, uh, Gedanken games uh, to try to understand how, um, how those fidelity witnesses work. So when you're talking about certification tests, it's already some sort of query and answer problem. You say like, is my test, is my state preparation good? And then you say yes or no. So um, one, uh, one thing to consider, which for, was maybe trivial, but interesting that you can maybe generalize. So I will consider two trivial states, but in the quantum formalism. So, so, um, so I take trivial states just to make it, uh, make it trivially easy to understand. So you have two states. I will give me how either the zero state or I will give him a state where I put a, a flip somewhere, but I, I don't even know where. I will randomly put it somewhere. So what does Michal have to do? Like go through the entire state and there's like very many. So let's say L is scaling and it's very large. Go through all of them or how do you decide this? And the way I formulated it here is to say that for example, state discrimination as you have in the Watchos textbook or, or Nissen Schwank, you can use it for certification as well in principle. So you can assume that you have some knowledge what to expect and then you say I certify given those promises. So you can do state discrimination, but this is sort of trivial, especially in this example. <laughs> and uh, you can use a fidelity witness for those. And if you have non-trivial states, then, then maybe you would rotate by, by your unitary, the, this witness as I was saying before. So you can use the fidelity witness. But uh, there's also a very, very cool method from um, you and Flamia. Uh, it's called direct fidelity estimation. And the way it, it works is, is by doing something insane. So you take your state and you go to Hilbert space. So you decompose it over possibly exponentially many Pauli operators. So for me, Z is the, the Z Pauli. And then you have all possible strings. It should be a Kronecker product, sorry, in the sum. But it's basically the state that's in, um, the state decomposition of, of a computation basis state, so it's diagonal. And then what they say is you can just randomly pick at random the entries in that state. All of them come with the same weight. So you just randomly take that one and then you measure that observable in your system. And from this, they construct an estimator where they say it suffices to, to measure a constant number uh, of times to get your fidelity for state, states that sometimes scale in, uh, in N. So basically they, they can get estimates for fidelity in cases where the number of qubits is scaling and they don't need to scale the statistic. And, um, and for me, this is magical. I was showing a magic ball and, and that, that's something that I want to tell you that sometimes it's, uh, it's really a hard problem to get anything, but miracles happen in this business and that, that's um, a really lovely paper. Yep. So like, this is more efficient than using this, uh, that gives you, okay. They, what, like, the, okay, they, like this procedure you explained uh, approximates fidelity, uh, okay. but like, you can also use it like to have, uh, I guess, bounds on, fidel on fidelity, this, right? So like how it compares to, uh, uh, so it's, I, I guess, much more efficient than the, this other approach with this uh, Z, the, like this fidelity which is beat from Z, right? So, so here probably you need to repeat quite often, right? Yeah, that, that's that's kind of the second time where, where I'm a little bit unprepared because I, I should actually compute it at some point. What I still wanted to tell you is that the gap here is quite small. So the, the state with, with the actual excitation 
um, has an expectation value that, that um, goes, the difference in expectation values of that fidelity witness. You, you can use also other ideas. But this choice, which is sort of simple, yeah. um, the expectation values will sort of converge in the thermodynamical limit, right? Because if, if I have one single excitation, one of the terms in the sum will flip. Yeah. But I'm dividing by one over L. So I will have L over L or L minus two over L, but in the thermodynamical limit, it will be very small. So that, that's, for example, one problem. But uh, I'm also having an escape route to say this is everything like only to give you one idea where those different protocols are meeting and you can say, how would I apply this one or that one? But, uh, but this example is not designed for a fidelity witness test, I think. Uh, so fidelity witnesses behave best for those kind of quenches and, and where you have loads of correlations. In this kind of setting, it's, um, it's very likely that, that it will not perform well and um, there's nothing wrong about it. When you design those heuristics, it's really you're targeting a maybe specific purpose and, and, and then, then you go. The direct fidelity estimation is definitely good for like banner states and, and, and cluster states and this kind of stuff. Because then you have um, amplitudes uh, or coefficients in your decomposition that are sort of either zero or one. And, uh, and then you just sample the, 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 the state uh, very nicely and then you go. But um, I was talking about important something because I was learning about important something from Martin and uh, Leandro based on this paper. And we never found a setting where we would have such an non-trivial case that, that you show that it's constant, for example. It's really a, a, a case of a magic ball. <laughs> okay, uh, the reason why it works is that if I randomly sample my measurement, then uh, with probability one half, my measurement will depend on, on that hole. It will be somewhere in, in the system, but most of my choices for the Z measurements will cover that, or half of them will cover that hole, yeah? So what I have to do is that if half of them are flipping this expectation value, I have to sample until uh, until I, I go away from, from finite statistics and uh, asymptotically one half of my measurements will depend on the whole and one half will not. So you only need to use halfling to show that, that with high probability it's a balanced case and, and that, that's how direct fidelity works with, with this important sampling. That, that just to give you an idea why it can be so powerful as it is in their paper, because of course they do it in the more, much more non-trivial cases than, than this case. So I, I guess they do, they, they do. Okay, the way you presented it, like it looks like a, like they do it for stabilizer state, right? Yeah, or, yeah. Because actually here, I mean, it seems that you might just do, uh, well, computational basis measurement. Yes, yes. Right? And, and you can use... Was, Yes, in fact, just in one go. That yes, would yes. Give you the... And and you need to all. It's it's a tough game because if you want to have some sort of um, lower bounds on, on on a separation between the methods, you need to rule out some possibilities for for um, being crafty. So, for example, here you will have commuting observables, so you can use a lot of statistics from a single state preparation and so on. And I think actually. For, for the cluster states, I think it wasn't constant, but there exist interesting entangled states that, that scale in, the, the, in the, the number of qubits and, and, um, and important something can give you a constant, um, constant statistics um, and, and then, then it's nice. But this, this is not to explain direct fidelity estimation because it wouldn't do justice to the method. This is just to give you the idea why important something is super powerful. It's, uh, it's uh, a nice trick. I didn't find a better way to use important something yet, but who knows, maybe uh, after the vacation, who knows, maybe for Christmas we'll find something. But um, yeah, it, it's really a fun thing to, to think about. Okay, another um, really uh, tough, uh, tough, um, uh, uh, tough line of thought for me was to try to understand whether all fidelity witnesses are parent Hamiltonians. So we were talking about this MPS tomography where MPSs admit parent Hamiltonians. So if you have a state set that this state is the unique ground state of that Hamiltonian, then basically those two descriptions uh, are equivalent. I can give you a Hamiltonian and Michal computes the ground state and you will get the state that I have in mind. 
So I can give you the couplings prescription and you will get my state. And this is what you use uh, for this kind of parent Hamiltonian fidelity witness. So, uh, yeah, so that, that's this one. And the fidelity witness in general does the same. You have some W and then it gives you the, the unique state. So I was wondering whether it's always that. And I was reading finally more carefully the Watchers textbook. And there's the formula 3.111. <laughs> And um, you have the um, SDP characterization of uh, the fidelity. And as soon as you have some sort of maximi maximization, which gives you the fidelity, you can constrain your maximization and you will get a lower bound. So that, that's a way to construct a fidelity witness. This one is, um, is frustratingly unpractical and, and terrible because uh, you will never get any sort of Oracle access to a large row t and row p such that you have nice correlations between those states and it's an admissible state preparation so it's a positive density matrix and then you just measure out the trace x but in principle it tells you that the fidelity functional in general you don't have the equality there because in general it's a nonlinear uh, functional here uh, and it depends on the entire density matrix so you might get those nonlinear witnesses in some way this one is just hopelessly unpractical, um, but at least I get the satisfaction that, that it's not only parent Hamiltonian possible. But you get the idea, right? I mean, any admissible density matrix to this SDP will give me a fidelity lower bound. So if I get one with trace X um, and non-trivial, so a little bit larger than zero, then I get my fidelity lower bound. It's just the, the tough thing about this idea is that um, you cannot probably optimize over those access so nicely. I mean, you have quantum algorithms for, for SDPs, but this is not the kind of things you can do easily, I think. Because you need to, it, it has also the direct sum structure. So it's, this, this is basically um, not so nice, but there's another one, um, which is sort of, I think almost the last thing I want to tell you. Another trick from the Watchers book, which is this uh, theorem by uh, Speckens and Rudolf. And it's the Gaussian, uh, uh, sorry, it's the sum of uh, squares relation. Sorry, the, the lower box shouldn't be there. Yep. So the, uh, the Speckens Rudolf uh, idea is that you can have an intermediate state. So I have two states and they maybe don't have the perfect overlap, but I can try to mediate the fidelity information through some, um, some um, intermediate state sigma. So if I want to get the fidelity between row zero and one, I can compute the fidelity to sigma and then compute sigma to row one, square those two things, and I optimize over all sigmas and it, with equality, I will get the actual fidelity. So then, then we do uh, what, what we do, we restrict the, the variational uh, optimization. We can say, may, maybe you say a Gaussian, uh, Gaussian uh, mediating state, then, um, for individual ones within this optimization, you can try to use the fidelity witness uh, as you know it, but then you might get a lower bound to the fidelity between the um, two non-Gaussian um, uh, density matrices. That would be the idea. So um, yeah, um, this one is um, also a little bit hopeless because often you will not find two interesting states that are close to the same uh, Gaussian state. That that's probably the lesson. But anybody who's interested into searching for something like this, it might be an interesting case. Yeah. Uh, but I guess the point here is to have not Gaussian uh, roti, right? As far as I understand, because for Gaussian yeah, roti, yeah. you know. Yeah. Okay. Yeah. But but I was stressing this before that that the the this fidelity witness formula that I was giving you you mm -hmm. can evaluate this to a non-Gaussian state. And it's not also not going to be tight. So you're somehow losing fidelity as you go. So you, you, you will have to be quite close and, and so on. But in principle, you say, I give you two non-Gaussian states and, and try to compute some fidelity for me. And this, uh, this formula is nice because it's, um, it's tight in, in some sense, yeah. It's not clear how it behaves under a restricted optimization, and I haven't run any numerics on this. I just found it uh, uh, last month. You can use other ideas like the triangular, uh, triangular inequality, for example. So you take 
I don't know, maybe the one norm and then and, uh, and, uh, um, and then some sort of thin square or, or, or some, some bound like this. So I think here this is largely open and I don't know if anybody has looked um, into it. I'm not aware of anything. I was asking the Andro and he didn't uh, point out anything to me. But this is sort of where it might be something that you squeeze out, which is more interesting than the Hartree Fork witnesses, but still doable and so on. So um, one thing to note is that this bond becomes non-trivial only when your individual Gaussian witnesses are more than 0.7 or something like this, because you're squaring and then you're losing a lot of uh, the fidelity sure. that you worked hard to get. Um, so. Yeah, I don't know how well it can perform, but who knows? I mean, when I was biking to, to my sister to give the talk, I was thinking about um, ground state preparation. So if you if you use um, um, some sort of amplification, you want to sometimes start from uh, from something that is expo has a, an exponentially small overlap. And if you if you wanted to say it has to work because I have some sort of small overlap to, to something you could maybe yeah. ma maybe 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 yeah yeah but like if, if it has exponential is uh, large you mean like close to one overlap right no, no, no. So, so you need to make sure that your starting state has at least exponent a more than exponentially small overlap if it's sub exponentially small then then, um, okay. then those Amplification algorithms will not work because face okay. has to crunch. Uh, it it doesn't have to be much, but it should be something. Okay, uh, that that gives you some some promise at least. Okay. Yeah. yeah. And, uh, hmm? and then maybe uh, a chain of sequential some sort of Hartree Fock perturbation theory yes. and then putting them together, and maybe at some point you can prove that you have the right starting state and then. I okay. Don't know. Mike, Mike. So, okay, we need to kind of conclude. Yes. Yes. Okay. We are meeting a holiday uh, mood, and it's warm, I guess. In yeah, the, yeah, yeah. Okay. Thank, thanks <laughs> for, uh, for bearing with me. I mean, uh, okay. Sorry for yes. prolonging too much. No, no, no. It's uh, okay. Yeah. So, um, I was telling you a lot of many quick sentences about how our devices are getting good, and we need those post tomography tools. So I really recommend, for example, that MPS tomography paper, a lot of those ideas that are summarized in the infographics that I have shown in between. Um, you have a nice starting point to look for nice methods there. Um, my point was that fidelity witnesses are experimentally friendly, so um, so might be nice for, for some um, devices in the near term or maybe uh, longer term as well. The ones that, uh, that I, I was mentioning have a nice statistics scaling, which is something to keep in mind always when, when you try to have some practical application. This, this cannot be underestimated. And, and here we were talking about this um, important something. Okay. Uh, here just the summary of those works. And, um, and if I'm not showing some work that, um, that um, did something interesting in this case, then you have to really uh, let me know because I don't know about it and I should. So um, here, just for your convenience, the, the summary of the works that I'm aware of, or just at least examples in, in some particular cases. Good. Okay. So. Uh, yes. Yeah. Thank you. <laughs> Thanks, Mike, for uh, for a nice uh, talk and overview of, of, of this uh, important field, I would say, and uh, developing still. Uh, I kept on asking our guests today questions. So if others have questions, please go ahead. Otherwise, yeah. You can also complain. <laughs> if, if there's any complaints, this is, a, this is a perfectly valid comment. OK. Yeah. OK, Miho, thanks so for it seems, uh, uh, no, There are no questions. We had quite a lot of discussion in the middle of, uh, of the talk. So yep. uh, thanks a lot, uh, Mike, again for uh, for joining us.